I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. Did you see something in the sky over the weekend? We've been flooded with your questions and comments asking what was that line of light streaking across the night sky over the weekend? Everyone has a theory, of course, from a UFO to a jumbo jet flying way too low. Here are some of the messages we got in from you. A viewer named Sky, no, we're not making that up, said, I saw some crazy lights over Coos Bay Bandon at Bullard's Beach. I have a video. I've never seen anything like it. And Jessica wasn't too far behind asking, were there UFOs or flying objects reported Friday night? My son took a strange video in Beaverton, Oregon. You asked, we went and got answers. Take a look at what we're talking about. Along with your questions and comments, plenty of you also sent in photos and videos. Thank you. For those of you who wondered, it's not aliens. Sorry to disappoint, not to worry. The lights are actually a cluster of satellites launched by SpaceX. The moving line of lights are usually only visible for about four minutes, but once you see it, it's almost impossible to look away. Kyle Boshi tells us more. I got it. Social media was abuzz with excitement and wild speculation after a strange and stunning train of lights moved across the night sky. It's like a train. <laughs> it keeps going. That's wow, that is the coolest thing ever. Dozens of people in the Portland area reported seeing something streak overhead both on Friday and Saturday night. And like, is it a plane? With, it's reflecting off of something? Like It looked like something from a sci-fi movie. What is it? Sorry, it's not a UFO. Instead, these are low orbiting satellites speeding along in a near perfect line. We were at the right place at the right time. We were able to see that's what called train. Jim Todd, director of space science education at OMSI explains, these so-called satellite trains are a cluster of small satellites just released by Elon Musk's SpaceX cargo rockets. The Starlink satellites will eventually grow dimmer as they move into higher orbits and provide high-speed internet to remote areas on the planet. For many people, this is the first time they experience it and they see it and because it's fairly new. The Starlink satellites are hundreds of miles above us, much closer than traditional satellites, which are very large and orbit far out in space. The bright light is caused by reflections from the sun. The satellite 10 or 11 are in the sunlight, but you, the viewer, is in the dark. This isn't the first time we've seen a Starlink satellite train streaking overhead. Just after nine slow moving lights were spotted over Western Washington. In May of 2021, people in Washington and Oregon witnessed a similar sky show. SpaceX plans to launch thousands of Starlink satellites which means these unusual streaks of light may not be so unusual. This won't be the only time you're going to see this train. There's more to come. Thank you, Kyle. Didn't we see something like this in Total Recall? Just kidding, probably not. Each satellite weighs just under 600 pounds and is roughly the size of a flattened car. SpaceX hopes to blanket the space around Earth with the satellites in order to bring high speed Internet across the globe. But there are some concerns about that. First, having that many satellites in orbit increases the risk of collision with other satellites. And if that happens, both basically explode, sending shrapnel searing through space, endangering other satellites. The other worry is just how bright the satellites shine in the night sky, potentially interrupting astronomical observations. SpaceX says it's addressing those concerns with systems meant to avoid collisions and a visor to help lower the reflectivity of each satellite. But right now, there are no laws or regulations protecting the aesthetic of the night sky as capitalism soars to new heights with money to be made miles above the Earth's surface. Meteorologist Joe Ranieri joins us now. Joe, are we going to get a chance to see those satellites again tonight? Absolutely. And in fact, I got a chance to see it on Saturday night on top of the uh, KGW studios. A bunch of us went up to the roof to check it out. It was absolutely incredible. And if you're hoping to check it out tonight, you're in luck. So here's a look at where to look uh, for the satellites this evening. Just after nine o'clock, look in the southwest northeast part of the sky and then you get a chance to see it tomorrow at 911 and again Wednesday night uh, a little after 930. But again, uh, the timing of this can all change a little bit because they are satellites. But as we look at the future cast, here's a look where the clouds will be and late tonight. You're not going to be seeing any evidence of any clouds and that's going to hold true heading into tomorrow night as well. Uh, come Wednesday, there will be a little bit of some clouds throughout the morning, but heading into the later part of this week, as you can see, we're going to be seeing basically clear skies. So there will be a lot of opportunities to 
check these out. Of course, you just heard from Jim Todd and he said this is going to be something we, we get used to seeing uh, into the uh, coming months, coming years as well. So as we look at more about the Starlink satellites, they fly between 270 to 340 miles uh, above the Earth. Uh, and we can see uh, up to about 2700 satellites in orbit currently. And as we look at some of the, the videos, they're pretty incredible. They are pretty fast. These satellites travel Patrick at 17,500 miles per hour and they hover just um, a little bit higher than where the International Space Station is at. And again, the International Space Station is basically 20,000 miles from where we're at. But it's just incredible to see some of these images <clears throat> out there. And uh, it took a, a few minutes to to basically kind of have your eyes adjust out there to the night sky on Saturday night. I was waiting and waiting. I saw some stars and constellations, even some planets. It was so clear out. And then boom, once you see it, you cannot take your eyes off of it. It's absolutely incredible to see. And if you're wondering how long does it last, it lasts a good amount, four to five minutes. At first on Saturday when I was looking at it, it would look shot up just like a rocket and then it just started to go right above the horizon and it was absolutely incredible to see. So again, you do have a chance in the next couple of nights, especially tonight with clear skies just after nine o'clock. Uh, just look at the uh, southwest part of the sky throughout the city and you'll be getting a good chance to see it. And it is bright. You know, a lot of these, um, you know, images you need to get away from the city lights. Not these. These are very bright as you can as you saw from that video and those pictures. Yeah, sounds great. We'll look for that tonight. Thank you, Joe. And now to something nearly as common as the stars in the sky, graffiti in Portland. You have let us know several times how much this frustrates you. Jay emailed earlier this month. I write to graffiti abatement department often to remove graffiti in the neighborhood. They used to react now nothing. Are they shut down? Well, no, we don't think so, Jay, but it may feel like it with the sort of response that you're getting. No doubt about that. One TXT emailed back in June to say, I've reported several highway signs covered in graffiti to ODOT, PBOT, and Portland Civic Life's graffiti program multiple times since January of 2021. No change. Nothing was ever done. They also included some snapshots of ODOT signs leading from the Fremont Bridge to Highway 30. Not a pretty sight, although I believe some of those signs have since been cleaned up, but that is really nasty. Also in June, Jennifer emailed to say the graffiti that litters our buildings, garbage cans and everything else is not art. It's ugly and it makes our city look trashy. But what can the city do about this? Is there a schedule or a plan to wash and repaint? Are we just stuck with all this? Well, that's a great question. I tried to contact the city office handling graffiti and asked them that very question, Jennifer. And yeah, we never heard back. I know these are examples that are just scratching the surface of frustration over graffiti. I share your frustration. I took a stroll down to Pioneer Square in Portland just after lunch today and snapped some pictures of the graffiti I saw. It's so common that many of us probably just walk or drive by without even noticing anymore. And in fairness, there were some blocks downtown with no graffiti. Then again, the beautiful Jackson Tower building just off Pioneer Square in Portland's living room has lots of graffiti. See it way up there at the top. It's been there for weeks now. OK, well, that looks daring and wrong. In light of all that, this past weekend, Portland police announced something that's going to make some of you pretty happy. They're going to start cracking down on prolific graffiti vandals who cover our buildings and streets and highway signs. And this morning, 22 year old Emil Laurent was charged with 25 counts of criminal mischief. He's one of those prolific vandals Portland police say they're going after. According to the DA's office, Laurent's charges stem from a series of incidents that cover the last four years when Laurent allegedly tagged buildings and structures with the tag Tendo. Investigators think that that's shorthand for Nintendo. Get it? Take that for what it's worth. Here's a partial list of the places he's accused of tagging and the cost covered up. One of the most expensive American medical response off Southwest 2nd. That cost $6,000. Public storage off North Gantenbine Avenue, $5,700. F.E. Bennett off Northeast Broadway Street, $2,700. And various City of Portland properties, at least $1,600. The DA reports total cost of these and other properties is nearly $20,000 and growing. And that's just a slice of the problem. Graffiti is so bad in the Portland area that the state legislature last year gave the Oregon Department of Transportation an extra two million dollars for graffiti cleanup here. That's not free money, by the way. That's your tax money. 
And that's how much this is costing taxpayers. I talked with Dan, Don Hamilton, an ODOT spokesman about that today. It's all over the place. It's alongside the freeways. It's on the highway signs themselves. We've got extra crews out there. We've got our own maintenance crews out there taking this on. It's really underway everywhere, and we're doing the best we can to try to take this on right now. Why isn't there more happening faster? I mean, some of these signs are important directional signs that are covered by graffiti. We are taking these on as quickly as we can. The legislature last year authorized an additional $2 million for us to start attacking graffiti. Hamilton told me the state has hired a local company called Portland Graffiti Removal, which has a crew working for ODOT five days a week cleaning up the graffiti. He said it's frustrating for everyone when the stuff is wiped away, painted over, and then the taggers come right back. We're very pleased that police are going after the bad guys in this, and we're doing everything we can to work with police to make sure that we can try to get these bad guys uh, to their attention and get the police, uh, take, get the t police to take care of them. Finally, the Portland mayor's office put out a statement about this most recent arrest. It reads, we will not allow Portland to be marred by graffiti and vandalism. I hope those responsible for defacing our city are held accountable for the damage caused. I want to thank the Portland Police Bureau for their work to investigate and apprehend the suspect. Finally, here's my opinion in this. In the 32 years that I've worked as a reporter here, I don't really remember Portland ever truly cracking down on graffiti vandals in anything more than an isolated arrest or maybe two. The city did try to make it harder for them to buy markers about 13 years ago, which is why now it's a hassle to buy spray paint to touch up your lawn furniture. But that had questionable impact. Some argue that graffiti is an art form, and I have seen beautiful mural work, but that's not what we're talking about here. Tagging, spray painting of a word or a signature, that's not art. It's a statement that the rules and the laws are not being enforced in this city. So that statement from the mayor's office, in my opinion, rings really hollow. You're not going to allow Portland to be marred by graffiti and vandalism? Way too late. It is marred by those very things right now as I'm standing here. And I think it's a good sign that police, specifically the neighborhood response team from Central Precinct, is going after these folks. Enough is enough. Well, that's my take. What do you think? Am I full of it? I could be. You don't have to agree with me, but you do have to chime in. Send me an email. Let me know what you're thinking. Our address is the story at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail 503-226-5090. Now, if you followed this story through the weekend, you probably saw the suspect's mugshot on TV and social media. You'll notice that we're choosing not to show it today. In fact, if you've watched us often, you probably realize we don't show mugshots all that often at all. We're kind of pulling back the curtain for you here. And here's why we don't do that. Last year, the Oregon legislature passed a bill that limits law enforcement agencies like Portland Police from releasing booking photos of suspects. Lawmakers who helped pass that bill said at the time that they worried that mugshots led to the doxing and harassment of people arrested during social unrest protests. Others have argued that it makes it difficult for people to undo the damage of the accusation if they are later not charged or found not guilty. However, there are a few instances where police agencies can still give those mugshots out. They include to the person in the photo, to the victim of the person in the photo, or to the public if an agency says there's a need to apprehend a fugitive or a suspect in a criminal investigation, which is exactly what happened with Emile Laurent. We showed you his mugshot throughout the weekend while well, he was still a fugitive, but when he turned himself in this morning, we decided to take down his photo and stop showing it because the police were no longer looking for him. By the way, we checked in this afternoon, and since he's not accused of a violent crime, he is not being held in jail. Moving on to Oregon City. Oregon City voters, you are going to elect a new mayor tomorrow. And if you think that sounds familiar, well, it's because it really is. This will be Oregon City's third new mayor in the last two years. And there's yet another election in just a few months. It all started in the spring of 2020 with former mayor Dan Holliday. He was serving his second term when things started to get, well, shall we say, controversial. When the state shut down because of the pandemic, Holiday considered issuing a declaration to reopen Oregon City businesses in defiance of the state orders. And then he changed his mind after the attorney general came after him. 
Then, during protests over the murder of George Floyd, Holliday got backlash for social media posts that he made downplaying police brutality against black people. Holliday was recalled in the fall of 2021. Then there was a special election for someone to finish Holliday's term. Voters elected Rachel Lyle Smith, an Oregon City Commissioner. She filled the seat until this spring when she resigned. She said she wanted to move out of state to spend more time with her family. So now, Oregon City voters are holding another special election to fill Smith's seat, which was filling Holiday's seat. You keeping track of that at home? Three people are now running to become Oregon City Mayor, at least for a few months. There's Denise McGriff, who has been filling in as the mayor. She's also a city commissioner. Also uh, running is retired entrepreneur Dan Burge and retired mechanic Alan Bedore. We talked with McGriff and Burge today, but we couldn't get a hold of Bedore, and he did not have a picture available. So, what are their priorities? Well, both mentioned traffic and tolling on I-205. Here's candidate Denise McGriff. What we really would like to do is have ODOT come to the table with us uh, and really sit down and have a really deep discussion because we have diversion right now. And I think it's only going to get worse. In Oregon City and West Lynn, Highway 43, Willamette Falls Drive, and our Main Street and 99E get backed up just if some little tweak happens to McLaughlin or to I-205 or to I-5, people come through here and then there's a backup. And I don't know if, I think one of the things we talked about was tolling one small section is not really going to solve the problem. Candidate Dan Burge also said he had concerns about the traffic in Oregon City and said that he wants to see the city's rules and regulations reworked and streamlined. For example, when it comes to new construction. We need to preserve the trees. We need to preserve the water underneath the ground. It feeds the trees. Uh, I I'm also uh, have built houses in Oregon City and stuff. And the, the rules are, 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 are need changing. They're flexible, they're variable. Uh, they need fixed things to do, and we need to fix the, you know, when we come in and do a subdivision or something, the communications underneath the ground, the zero to 15 feet between the big, you know, 200 year old and 300 year old trees uh, gets dug away. The water table gets dug away, and the water is just instantly down to the river. Uh, so that's the reason we're losing a lot of our cedar trees in Oregon City now. This is also going to be the first election for Clackamas County Clerk Sherry Hall to handle after that big blurry barcode fiasco back in the May primary. It delayed the vote count for a few weeks. There's already been a hiccup in this one. The clerk's office sent the wrong voters pamphlet inserts a few weeks ago. So we'll let you know how this all goes. The largest race discrimination verdict in Oregon history, a whopping $4.4 million. You know, people of color should be able to go into a store and shop and not be profiled. Why Walmart will be paying up and how a new law helped make it all possible when the story returns.
A Multnomah County jury agreed with a local man that he was harassed for basically shopping while black and that Walmart ignored warnings about a bad security worker for the store. The jury awarded Michael Mangum four million dollars. Kyla Boshi has the story. I never thought it would happen to me. I never thought it would happen to me. Michael Mangum says he could feel someone staring at him as he shopped for light bulbs at the Walmart in Wood Village in March of 2020. The 61-year-old believed he was being racially profiled by a theft prevention employee. In the moment, I was, I was very, very angry. The Walmart worker told Mangum to leave. When he refused, the employee said he'd call police and falsely claimed Mangum had threatened to smash him in the face. So, so you're telling me right now he's going to trespass me from this property for what reason? Because he wants to. On Friday, a Multnomah County jury slapped Walmart with $4.4 million in damages. It's believed to be the largest verdict in a racial discrimination case in Oregon history. You know, people of color should be able to go into a store and shop and not be profiled. According to Mangum's attorney, Greg Kofori, the case is especially troubling because Walmart knew it had a problem with a loss prevention employee, but failed to take action. Walmart knew they had a guy making false police reports and he stayed on. During a deposition, a Multnomah County sergeant explained how he warned Walmart's general manager about a repeated pattern of false reports and exaggeration coming from the store's loss prevention worker. Walmart thinks the police work for them. Walmart has no respect for the community. It has no respect for its customers. Uh, and news about this guy went all the way up to the corporate headquarters. Nothing happened. In response to the multi-million dollar verdict, Walmart said, we do not tolerate discrimination. We believe the verdict is excessive and is not supported by the evidence. Walmart claims Mangum was never stopped by store security and refused to leave. The retail giant is considering its next steps, including post-trial motions and possible appeal. This case is also significant because it falls under a new law that allows people to sue if anyone improperly calls police with the intent to discriminate or humiliate someone else. The law was created by State Representative Janelle Bynum after she was racially profiled while canvassing in her Clackamas neighborhood. Kyle Boshi, KGW News. Still ahead on the story, we're taking a trip to the KGW vault for a moment you'll certainly remember from just five years ago. The moon blotting out the sun in the great American eclipse. You'll see the view from inside a plane at 40,000 feet. Coming up next.
We're taking a trip down to the KGW vault tonight to a moment many of you will remember. I certainly do. It's been five years since the great American eclipse was visible in Oregon. I was at the Kaiser Baseball Stadium. Where were you? Thousands flocked to the Pacific Northwest to put themselves in the path of full totality, the best seat in the house. But five years ago, some people decided they wanted to see the cosmic event from the sky. So they hopped on a very special flight to do just that. And our former colleague, Maggie Vespa, was along for the ride. Not long after dawn, boarding of the Alaska Airlines flight to chase the great American eclipse began. Passengers, including this very lucky reporter, <laughs> were pumped. The crew, too. Come on, everybody, let's hear it. You ready? <laughs> Everyone, especially those with a clear authority on the subject, growing increasingly giddy as we cruised west over the Pacific. It raises awareness in spaceflight. It raises awareness in astronomy. Between the darkening of the sky, the darkening of this cabin, it's going to be like a Broadway play, curtain time at a Broadway play. All the while, the flight crew tweaking every detail to make sure we hit totality as planned. Updating the winds and making sure that you know, there's no traffic conflicts. Then the show began. First, it was just a sliver, but of course, the moon kept encroaching. Actually, how fast it's going from up here. You're surprised by how fast it's going. Yeah. Finally, second shy of 10 a.m., these 100 relative strangers cruising at an altitude of 40,000 feet are the first to see the solar eclipse of 2017 in totality. That's it. We're the first ones to see it. This is so incredible. Reactions ran the gamut. Spectacular. Enjoyed it immensely. Oh, it's really interesting to see that, actually. I'm an astrophysicist, so I study this kind of stuff, but I've never seen it in person. I did not expect it at all. I didn't expect to cry a little bit, but uh, it's, it's just truly really overwhelming. And as the champagne flowed, Yay! researchers dreamed about the repercussions as this awe-inspiring sight moved east. There are millions of people, millions of young people who will see this and look at it. So we're going to have a resurgence, I think, in the coming years of scientific uh, education and interest in this because if this doesn't turn you on to space, astronomy, science, if this doesn't turn you on, nothing is. It was something else. By the way, the next total solar eclipse is happening on April 8th, 2024. The duration of totality is going to be nearly double what the one in Oregon was back in 2017. But the path of totality stretches from Texas to Maine, so you'll have to travel if you want the full effect. It's worth it, by the way, if you can swing it. Go for it. When we come back, how you can help school kids make sure they have the supplies they need for this new school year.
Our Hey Help campaign is the KGW School Supply Drive. We're trying to raise enough money and supplies for more than 15,000 kids. And one of the best and easiest ways you can help is to give online. You can do it right now. Just grab your phone, aim your camera at the QR code there on your screen, and then donate on our website. And if you don't have your phone right now, no problem. Just remember, kgw.com school. That's the end of our show. Thanks so much for being here and for watching. Remember, the story, our story, well, that never ends.